Come aboard. You snooze, you lose. That's exactly why it's important for our favorite superheroes to make a killer first impression. So keeping that in mind, I'm not sticking to just one or two franchises. Today, we're covering the top 35 superhero first impressions in the movies. Like, share, and subscribe for more all-round content. Man, don't you just love it when the tables are turned? Rise of the Beast may not have been the blockbuster we were all expecting it to be, but we did still get some solid action from it. Now, if we're considering characters that made a great first impression, then look no further than Mirage. The mini transformation at the start was already enough of a jolt for Noah, but then our feisty bot had to take things even further by utilizing his Mirage effect quite literally. It's not too excessive or anything, but the sequence does manage to show us why Mirage is such a competent fighter. My favorite part about this scene is that it started with Noah trying to hotwire Mirage and steal him, but as soon as no one wanted out, Mirage locked him in and essentially kidnapped the unsuspecting chap. Bro just wanted to make an honest living stealing cars, but ended up getting involved in an alien robot war. Maximals, Autobots, roll out! <laughs> Twenty twenty three hasn't been a very friendly year to DC flicks, and The Flash is probably the best example of that. However, this shouldn't take away from the fact that Barry Allen gave us a pretty impressive first glance here. Yet, yeah, I know this isn't his first appearance in the DCEU, but it's his first solo film, so I believe that should count for something, right? It's pretty straightforward if you look at it from a surface perspective. You've got The Flash striking a pose for some TikTok kids. I am. after which he dashes his way to Gotham City to help out Batman. To me, what stands out the most is the moment right before Barry sets off. The sound effects make it seem as if it's a gun cocking right before a race. And to be fair though, I guess that's what this was in the first place. Also, what's with that weird running stance? Is it a Barry thing or an Ezra thing? Sam Wilson isn't a character that many would recognize. Yeah, I know they tried really hard with Captain America and the Winter Soldier on Disney+, Plus, but let's face it, that did more harm than good. However, Falcon did get to spread his wings nicely in the Winter Soldier movie, especially when he makes his first appearance with the jetpack. It's just so sudden and quick that you almost miss it. But even then, the scene really does establish Sam with some kind of credibility. Technically, he's still not wearing his main suit, but I guess costume changes are part and parcel of a superhero's lifestyle. Side note, how did nobody predict they were gonna make a Doctor Strange movie when they literally name dropped him as a threat to Hydra in Winter Soldier? Also, I love how Cap straightens Sitwell's suit before letting Black Widow kick him off. He's just so polite, isn't he? Fire! 
know what I love about this movie? No overhyped consequences, like the end of the world or any other apocalyptic stuff like that. It's just a glimpse into Dredd's everyday life that makes him badass. It's also one of the many reasons why I prefer this version to the Sylvester Stallone version. Sorry Sly, at least you still got Rocky and Rambo though, right? The introduction to Carl Urban's Judge Dredd was a simple yet chilling sequence that gave us the perfect insight into his character. Bro ain't about the peaceful alternative to live in, he sees crime and just punishes it without mercy. The chase scene was obviously a nice rush of adrenaline, but even the final standoff where Dredd shoots the bald goon down was a piece of great filmmaking. Carl really does deserve a lot of praise for his acting, he's often been overlooked throughout his career. Well, at least he's built a name hunting soups for the boys now, eh? We all know and love Benedict Cumberbatch for his two major roles, Sherlock and Doctor Strange. The former might have been introduced very much in his element, but the latter has a slightly different story. We don't see Stephen as some crazy sorcerer or even a magician at a kid's party. Sorry, Tony, he's not meant for that kind of profession. Instead, Stephen's shown as an egotistical, loaded doctor whose attitude exceeds his own height. I know these are traits that aren't supposed to be likeable or anything like that, but at the same time, this scene made me extremely jealous of the guy and got me feeling that I need to live his kind of life. It's not like the guy's useless either. Just look at how he performs surgeries. The man's got it all, doesn't he? Money, fame, skills. Oh, wait, he didn't get the girl, did he? Oops, I guess that was an unintentional burn. Batman is a character who's recognised for a variety of reasons depending on who plays him. Michael Keaton gave us the thrills, Christian Bell gave us the chills, and George Clooney, well, he gave us nothing. Ben Affleck, on the other hand, probably had the most impactful first impression in his bat suit. The way he was crawling around the ceiling was so creepy and awesome at the same time. If I was one of those cops, I'd be pissing my pants as well. The distorted screaming, the rocking, everything about the musical score perfectly illustrated Batman from a criminal's perspective. A real supernatural presence. More than anything else, this is such an explosive scene that captures the very essence of the Dark Knight's true capabilities. This is why Zack Snyder was works so well as a director, especially for all these dark DC films. He can capture tone and content with great ease. When you've got massive shoes to fill, there's always the weight of expectation to deal with. To be fair, Shuri wasn't exactly begging for the role of Black Panther, it was bestowed upon her. So to see her claim the title with such style and class was very refreshing to watch, actually. From her somewhat anticipated appearance to the arm wrestling encounter with M'Baku, the entire sequence felt extremely triumphant for Shuri, even though I still have some reservations regarding the strength levels between the two. I also like the presentation of her new personality, because we should remember she is still dealing with the loss of T'Challa. For me, this is the scene that solidified M'Baku as one of my favourite Marvel characters. The pride and respect that he has for Shuri gives you a fair idea that he views her as family.
we all remember The Incredibles as being this super cool family in equally awesome red spandex. However, I just remembered that when Mr. Incredible does his transformation in the car, he's wearing a blue suit. Not that I've got a problem with the color or anything, it's just that their red suits are kind of like their brand now. As far as this scene's concerned, it's a perfect seg from dashing dad to equally handsome super dad. The sequence that follows is a nice little bonus that encapsulates what he's capable of and even seeing his family join him soon after gave a nice wholesome vibe. However, I'll still maintain that the highlight is what happens in the car. How do you even pull something off that quickly? It kind of reminded me of Tony Stark's epic transformation into Iron Man in Captain America Civil War. <laughs> I like Mark Ruffalo and all, but I don't know, man. I think Edward Norton could have given us a much more threatening version of the Hulk if he decided to continue. While I can't comment on contractual obligations and whatnot, I can compliment his first appearance in The Incredible Hulk. Of course, there's the suspense that leads to a great payoff, but more importantly, this was a thrilling sequence that gave us both sides of the character summed up in the best possible way. On one hand, we've got Bruce Banner, who's just trying to avoid getting angry, and on the other hand, there's Hulk who's, well, big and mad. Glowing green eyes, flowing straight hair, and a temper that's unmatched to any other version. 2008 Hulk is the best. There you go, I said it. Sorry, but I'm a man of violence, and I enjoy watching the Hulk wreck everything in sight. For a character who doesn't really get much character development during the entirety of her existence, Valkyrie actually had a pretty badass first impression. This isn't like her first appearance or anything, but it's the first time we see her in action, so that's gonna count in my books. Now, my main area of concern is when Valkyrie takes on Loki, but I do wanna shout out the brief flashback she's given. I know it involves Hela massacring her entire army of sisters, but the entrance looked extremely impressive for me not to mention. What this scene essentially does is give us some context for Valkyrie's actions. It really Help me because I was trying to figure her deal the entire time. Also, for her to be able to defeat Loki after being forced to live through such a horrible memory is pretty badass. Now, if you're not a 90s kid or older, then this one might seem a bit out of pocket. Well, I don't really care, because it's about time somebody showed love to this hugely underrated cult hit. 1994's The Crow was a fresh, dark take on the idea of an anti-hero, which the world just wasn't ready for at that time. Brandon Lee puts in such a splendid performance, which makes it such a shame that he had to be taken away by that accident on the set. The flashback scene is such a crucial moment in the film, because it helps us understand Eric so much better. What made the character so memorable to me wasn't the violence or the action scenes, but the smaller moments where we see Eric be kind to the little girl and the police officer, and how he still cares for his cat Gabriel. It gave him so much personality and made him a lot more endearing as a heroic figure. <sighs> Rest in peace, man. We were all robbed of an exceptional talent. No! Oh, 
Oh man, I really wanted this film to be a hit and it was all just because of Michael Keaton making his comeback as the legendary Bruce Wayne. Seriously man, a legacy character like the first ever Batman to grace the big screen deserves a lot more than a box office bomb in 2023. His first appearance in the film is more than enough to warrant ticket sales, you know. It's such a nostalgic moment that I couldn't help but feel a little warm inside. Come on, wouldn't you feel the same way? After all, you're seeing one of your favourite childhood heroes actually show up on screen when you're old enough to appreciate them the right way. I mean, his mere presence was enough to knock one Barry off his feet, wasn't it? Yeah, there's the obvious use of CGI and de-aging, but I'll allow it. The best part is that this scene actually extends to the drop-off from the bat plane as well. That's more than enough to mark a memorable first impression. Well, Spider-Man was always going to be on this list. He'll make a great first impression no matter what he does. In this case though, he surely earns it with ease. The opening sequence to The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is around 10 minutes long, which I'm sure must feel like a lifetime for the TikTok crowd. However, this scene is nothing short of an action-filled spectacle. It's the perfect summary of our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, and he does so much without even breaking a sweat. Bro takes down a wannabe rhino, saves the fossil fuel version of Electro, and attends his girlfriend's graduation speech all within the same time frame. Show me a man who can do all of that and then make him president. Honestly though, I'm glad to see that No Way Home started making people give Andrew Garfield the respect he deserves. At the end of the day, he's the amazing Spider-Man. pretty tough to make your first impression in an Avengers sequel because you've got some massive names to impress. None of that matters to Quicksilver though, and I'm not even talking about Peter Maximoff. It's his Russian counterpart Pietro who makes the mark here, and oh boy, does he kick butt or what? To be able to smack down both Captain America and Hawkeye within just a few seconds is as good as it gets when it comes to introducing yourself, but the man went a step further and even flexed on Hawkeye with the iconic, didn't see that coming line. Keep in mind that this happens in the middle of the epic attack on Hydra, which is badass enough as it is. Oh yeah, that also reminds me, I love how Thor is just so laid back in this whole fight. I mean, he's thousands of years old, fought countless battles, and is the champion of Asgard. It is just another day at the office for him. Now this was a character I was dying to see on the big screen, so it felt a bit anticlimactic to witness him ruin what was an otherwise heartwarming moment between two sincere women. However, I'm not here to crib about that. I'm talking about his first encounter with Bruce Wayne, where he finally makes his introduction and tells him about the upcoming war. It's a moment of maturity for Bruce and also shows how trusting he's become of aliens. I mean, this is the same guy who tried to kill Superman simply because he was an overpowered man from outer space. I'll also give Ben Affleck props for his acting here. He really pulled off the troubled orphan vibe when his parents get mentioned. On a more serious note though, did nobody question the fact that Martian Manhunter has been sitting out the last three planet destroying events and is only just showing up to offer help? Well, not that it matters anyway since the DCEU has been gunned down.
So this is a unique one because technically Jane Foster was introduced way back in the first Thor movie. However, her persona as the mighty Thor is a completely different character, so this does count as a first impression from that angle. As much as the world may like to laugh at Thor Love and Thunder, I do think it's safe to say that Jane's first appearance here was pretty impressive. It comes out of nowhere and the fact that she's controlling a newly fixed Mjolnir just adds to her sass. I mean, the freaking God of Thunder saw his own hammer as a lost cause after what Hela did to it, but June, she saw that as an opportunity. Also, let's not forget how she calmly handled her ex-boyfriend after that. You could cut the awkwardness with a Stormbreaker, you know. Of course, this scene would have felt so much better if it wasn't shown in the trailers. I still have my reservations against this film and more specifically towards fake Deadpool. But you know what? I can't be mad at this guy. I mean, Ryan Reynolds was Deadpool before he was Deadpool. I love this guy. They couldn't have picked anyone else to play the role and we wouldn't have it any other way. The man is literally known for his charm and wit, so he makes for the perfect choice to play Wade Wilson. Of course, watching him slice through those goons in X-Men Origins was a treat to the eyes and even Stryker had to sing him a few praises. Although in hindsight, I think that that was just the director thinking he put in some clever for shadowing. Nevertheless, it's a great way to introduce yourself, so I was naturally disappointed when we saw what he became towards the end of the film. Also, I love how Deadpool tried to do the same thing against Cable, but ended up getting shot by each and every bullet. I guess aging is a thing, even for immortal superheroes. was ever a casting the X-Men franchise got right, it's Wolverine and Charles freaking Xavier. Don't get me wrong, dudes like Magneto are also pretty solid, but I genuinely believe that Patrick Stewart is the only man able to pull him off with such accuracy. I mean, they had to bring him back to play Professor X in a film that was all about alternate timelines. They gave us a female Captain America, a black Captain Marvel, and a dumb Reed Richards, but nobody dared change Charles Xavier. Bro's entrance in itself felt like a grand gesture, especially with that fancy wheelchair of his. I do fancy one of those myself, you know, it just looks so comfy. To hear Charles talk about Thanos was kind of strange, but also amazing, and I like how he was still himself and not some parody version. He wanted the safety of America Chavez because he wanted to guide another gifted youngster. Now that's what you call sticking to your brand. I know people aren't too cool with the whole bait and switch model Hollywood likes to use nowadays, especially with their legacy characters. Comic book movies are no exception, and we saw another example of it in The Flash. However, this one's actually got merit to it, because Barry Allen has been transported into an alternate universe. Since anything can happen here, Superman is... Well, Supergirl. And on top of that, she doesn't have the kind of calm demeanor you'd normally associate with Clark Kemp. Trust me, you do not want to get on her bad side ever. Just look at how she goes to town on all those Russian soldiers. There's absolutely no remorse whatsoever, and you can tell she ain't holding back those punches. Sure, they don't look as strong enough as what Kal-El's capable of, but that doesn't mean Supergirl's a pushover. After all, it takes a special kind of presence to be able to overshadow Michael Keaton's Batman in an action scene.
no one can replace Scarlett Johansson as Black Widow. She's an absolute legend, right? Think about it. She was 25 years old when we first saw her in Iron Man 2, and here we are 13 years later, still gorging upon her. It just goes on to show how awesome Marvel was with their casting when they first started out. Now, as far as first impressions are concerned, I think Tony Stark's request sums it all up, doesn't it? Not only is she stunning and beautiful, Natasha Romanoff can very easily take your breath away like she does here with Happy. I honestly couldn't tell if Bro was liking or hating the fact that he was being dominated by a total babe. On a more serious note though, especially considering that we all know how the Infinity Saga played out, seeing this now feels so wistful and nostalgic knowing Black Widow and Iron Man were the two Avengers who sacrificed their lives to save the universe. God damn it, I just had to make it emotional again, didn't I? If you're gonna be playing cards with the one and only Remy LeBeau, then you better not piss him off, even if you happen to be the freaking Wolverine. His first meeting with Gambit was probably the highlight of the entire film to me, because I was so looking forward to seeing the man in action. Yeah, there's Sabretooth murdering the Black Eyed Peas at the same time, but it's Gambit's card attack on Logan that got me going. It perfectly summed up the character, because he's being witty and careful one moment, and then going all out battle mode the next. One of the greatest regrets of my life will be the cancellation of the Gambit solo film. Film. I loved the cartoon character so much as a kid. The love story between him and Rogue, all of it was such a joy to watch and no, I don't mean that in a creepy voyeuristic way, okay? I really hope that the MCU has a plan for his character in the future, or at least give it a thought, you know? submarine uh no i think it's a man <laughs> Jason Momoa could have easily been a forgotten name with that one role he had during season one of Game of Thrones. Luckily, he knew his abs were his money makers, so he quickly gobbled up the role of Aquaman. Believe it or not, that film is still the highest grossing DC film to date. Warner Brothers must be really banking on the Lost Kingdom to make up for all the lost revenue this year. Okay, I'll stop being mean now. Let's get back to the epic moments. So he lifts a freaking submarine to mark his entrance. See, this is the thing. Arthur Curry was completely overshadowed by people like Super. Superman and Wonder Woman in Justice League that he didn't have his own time to shine. Here he does, and he makes it count like the rent is due. The fact that Black Manta and his men tried to fight Aquaman even after knowing that he lifted their transport vehicle out of the sea barehanded still amazes me. films probably gathered a bit of a cult following now, but I'll stick to my original opinion that it was given a lot of extra hate for no good reason when it first came out. My favourite moment from The Eternals is actually the intro itself. Like, I can't stop watching this scene. The soundtrack is awesome and the action sequence is great. I love how the first half of the sequence introduces all ten Eternals and shows each of their abilities too. Well, I suppose except for Sprite, which could have easily been shown as well. More importantly, we got a badass fight scene out of the whole thing, with everyone flexing their power without any reservations. I also want to point out the moment when they all stand together because it shows the five thinkers on the right and the five fighters on the left. So that's some smart filmmaking right there. Chloe Zhao didn't win an Oscar for nothing, you know.
you know, this is actually one of my favorites because it has so much going on. Vision is basically an Android version of Jarvis with superpowers, but the whole sequence around which he comes to life gives us so many little gems. First, there's the fact that Thor awesomely awakens him with a freaking thunder blast. Then there's the part where Vision starts to comprehend where he is. Him staring out the window always seems so beautiful to me because it was as if seeing the cityscape filled with people living out their lives gave him this instant empathy for humanity, which immediately made him better than Ultron. Oh yeah, there's also the part where he sees Thor's cape and awkwardly makes one for himself as well. And did I mention the part where he says there's no way he can make the Avengers trust him and then proceeds to do the one thing that would make anyone trust him? See, this is why I really love this moment. Ultron. Right. The God of Thunder didn't exactly make a massive splash at the box office when he was first introduced to the world, but just look how things turned out for him. He's the only character with four solo films and a fifth in the works. Watching his coronation scene did give me an idea that we're dealing with a larger than life character and the God of Thunder has proven himself time and time again since then. Of course, his grand celebrations were cut short by the Frost Giants, but at least we got to feel the general sentiment. It's been 12 years since this movie first hit theaters and now I can proudly say that Thor is an excellent case of character development. He starts off a proud, brash child, and by the end of the series, he's a thoughtful, careful, devoted to his friends, and functions as part of a team. The only thing he couldn't get over, though, was Mjolnir. Bro really needs to learn a thing or two about attachment issues. Thirty-one years later, and this movie is still one of the best ever made. It was during a time when films were still focusing on the art and James Cameron wasn't trying to hop on the woke bandwagon. Well, you know what they say, class is permanent, and that's exactly what Arnold Schwarzenegger had established with his role as the Terminator. Judgment Day is one of the rare cases where the sequel turns out to be better than the original. And if you're looking for references, allow me to mention T-800's first appearance. Seeing Arnold naked manage to win the ladies over and watching him throw giant men out of the window kept him in favor with all the boys as well. Bro was a Giga Chat before Giga Chads were even a thing. I mean, he enters the bar with nothing and leaves with a whole bunch of stuff taken forcefully from the patrons. <laughs> no wonder he went on to become governor. Venom's kind of like the best friend you never had. He's always giving you helpful suggestions. He won't ever let you die, and he doesn't shy away from giving his honest opinion. Truly a diamond in the rough. Now, Eddie Brock may not have gotten along well with his symbiote buddy in the start, but the end of the movie gave a totally different vibe. They're so perfectly synced, almost like clockwork. And I like the idea that Venom must have told Eddie inside his head, bro, say, we are Venom with me. It will be so cool. And then you can even see Tom Hardy smiling after he's done saying it. Keep in mind that this is the first and last impression they create in front of that robber guy who just ends up becoming an early dinner for the alien symbiote. See, this is how you work as a team. Don't know why Bully Maguire had such a hard time. A 
showed the fake version some love earlier, so you can bet your bottom dollar that the actual Deadpool is going to find his way into my top 10. Whenever I rewatch the highway scene, there are always two or three moments that have me in splits. The funniest of them has got to be the have you seen this man line. Guess me every single time, you know. Sometimes I wonder if Ryan Reynolds even had a script for this. If you told me he just slapped on some red latex, took a camera, a couple of swords and went to the highway, you know what, I would have believed you. Seriously though, I think this was a great move on behalf of Fox because they knew how pissed the fans were at fake Deadpool. Seeing the real Wade Wilson open his film with such a dynamic and hilarious sequence was the perfect way to set him up as an R-rated funny boy. <laughs> to hit the woman, so please play. If you truly believe that Guardians of the Galaxy would go on to become the fan favourite franchise it is today, then you do have incredible foresight. This is one of the best openings to any Marvel movie ever and was also an awesome way to introduce Star-Lord. I never thought I'd enjoy watching a random dude dance to some retro hits while on a mission to retrieve one of the Infinity Stones. James Gunn can create magic when he wants to and Star-Lord is probably one of the best characters he's ever written. Of course, if we minus that one horrendous decision. In 2014, I went into this film not knowing anything and I was pleasantly surprised at how good it was. I fell in love with every character, the music was top tier stuff. All things considered, I'll even go on to say that it's one of my favourite MCU flicks of all time, up there with the likes of Iron Man and Infinity War. Ah, the tricky quickie finally makes his way and it's a scene to remember for the ages. Seeing Evan Peters in his first ever appearance as Quicksilver was a stroke of genius by the creators and I'll forever be thankful to them for it. Just seeing this kid ridicule Beast, Charles Xavier and freaking Wolverine with just one simple statement was more than enough to establish him a grade A hero. Honestly, this is such a perfect concept for the Quicksilver character. He's nihilistic, bored and carefree because he has a superpower that reduces the meaning of everything since he experiences all of it slowly and nothing is a threat to him. Let's not forget the fact that bro's so fast he didn't only break the speed barrier but also crossed cinematic universes. I meant one division by the way, not the Jeffrey Dahmer thing on Netflix. Now that's the first impression you do not want to create. What do you guys want? I didn't do anything. I mean, are you FBI? No, you're not cops. Hey, what's with this gives you youngster's place? That's an... It's cool, it was disgusting. Who are you? A friend. Bad vibrations? Would you pay a million dollars to see Clark Kent turning into Superman for the first time ever on the big screen? I definitely would, and I'm not even ashamed to say it. In 1978, it was a special year indeed. We got to see Christopher Reeves turn into the Man of Steel, and it was brilliant. Seeing that first flight was a once-in-a-lifetime experience only the people of that era could experience firsthand. There's no CGI or any of that fancy VFX stuff here, just good old practical effects. The movie is so legendary, it's even been preserved by the Library of Congress. Even Richard Donner said that everyone in the studio was simply stunned by what they'd achieved by making Superman fly using a rig. Now that's when you know you've made history.
Yes, you knew you were going to see him here. So let me present to you Specimen Badass, Mr. Wolverine in the flesh. His first ever appearance in the MCU universe just had to be in an underground fighting ring because it holds up with his brand image as well. Seeing him take the first few blows was a bit worrisome, but it obviously got better when we realised that he was just playing around. There's this one thing that the film got right about Wolverine which matches with his character in the comics just as well, if not better. If your bones are composed of metal tougher than steel, it's going to at least hurt like heck for anyone that makes an uncushioned impact against them. You've got a feel for that fighter, eh? Bro really thought he had a chance against the TVCU's King of Sass. I know, but there's a problem. <laughs> You're not part of the group. Is it even a first impression if you don't hear Bruce Wayne saying, I'm Batman, in that husky voice of his? The character did take a bit of a beating with the whole George Clooney fiasco that was Batman and Robin, but if there was somebody who could bring him back to life, it had to be Christopher Nolan. And oh boy, did he deliver or what? The Dark Knight trilogy is the most epic piece of filmmaking you'll ever see when it comes to a comic book character. And you know what? It's not even up for debate. Seeing Batman in this darker element, fighting villains who genuinely gave you the heebie-jeebies, and even flexing his wealth as Bruce Wayne was the best thing that could have ever happened to the world of DC and it all boils down to that first scene where the Dark Knight makes his introduction to those goons at Doc. I can only imagine the audience's reaction to the moment. Hearing that Bale Batman voice for the first time must have been epic. <laughs> world will never know what it was truly robbed of in the endless talent that was Chadwick Boseman. Rest in peace, my man. I still remember seeing him for the first time in that Black Panther outfit while chasing the Winter Soldier. It was an amazing entrance, and the fight that followed gave us all a decent glimpse into his battle style. In my eyes, it's still the best introduction to any character in the MCU. I remember the theatre I was in when I saw this. Everyone cheered harder for the Black Panther than when even Spider-Man showed up. Now that's saying something, isn't it? Could it have been anyone else to take the top spot? I mean, this guy is the reason superhero movie blockbusters were even a thing. Tony Stark spearheaded the MCU juggernaut all the way till his exit in 2019, and nothing captures his essence better than his first ever Iron Man movie. Apart from being a brilliant story on its own, the film gave us some amazing scenes with Tony, and the one I'm mentioning here is with the Mark I suit. Sure, it doesn't look as cool as the others, but it's what kicked off the movement, and it also gave us a rather impressive first fight scene. Shoot as much as you want, but it's all all over when Iron Man says it's his turn. Bro literally gave a whole new meaning to the word firearms. Now that's a legend if I've ever seen one. Hope you liked the video, so please subscribe to the TV region and here's another video that I know you'll enjoy.